So topic for today's journal club is going to be SI joint uh, fusion and lumbopelvic fixation. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? We wanted to take another look at this given the recent data. Uh, so just want to introduce Neil Patel here, one of our fellows, and Jens Chapman, my partner. I uh, want to thank you all for coming in. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. So my, the topic of my uh, article that I chose was incidence of uh, new onset SI joint pain following lumbar fusion. And this was published in the Journal of Spine uh, Surgery in uh, 2019. So this is by three authors, and this is in UK. So what I really want to look at, and that's why I kind of chose this article, was to kind of understand the uh, incidence of SI joint pain following lumbar spine fusion. So the things that that kind of got me to this point was there's, of course, a movement in SI joint, and uh, it's the biggest axial joint we have in the body with, uh, and there's a lot of kind of uh, data on this about the movement, the rotation of, spa, of the SI joint, and the translation, which is pretty minimal, 2.5 degrees of rotation and 7 millimeters of translation. Um, and we know that the lumbar spine fusion surgery leads to increased stresses in the SI joint. Therefore, the frequency of SI joint pain uh, contributing to ongoing low back pain uh, can be reported as high as, high as 30 to 40 per, 42%. And the frequency of onset of SI joint pain following lumbar fusion surgery remains unknown because um, some of these patients present with kind of symptoms of SI pain plus lumbar pain, and then they just get one surgery or the other. So, uh, this study was focused solely on identifying the incidence and predisposing factors for SI joint pain after a successful lumbar fusion. So uh, simple criteria, I think um, I just gonna go through what they decided to <coughs> include and exclude. So uh, for the SI joint, you had to have pain at a specific location, again, as mentioned, as seen in the photo, lower lumbar region buttocks not originating in the spine of the hip. Then there are many provocative tests, as uh, you know, but uh, the Faber test, thigh thrust, iliac distraction, and Gesslin test, again, all of these somehow uh, put some more pressure on uh, SI joint or rotate the SI joint, compress or distract it to elicit some pain. And if that's positive, if two or four tests are positive, the authors consider that to be a positive SI joint uh, pain. And this is also very important is to have kind of CT guidance for SI joint block. There are multiple papers on this in terms of doing CT guidance versus fluoro versus doing um, fluoro with some kind of dye along with your um, uh, steroids or pain medicine. So you know that the dye entered the joint and you successfully uh, injected the joint. Um, so the methods they used was a retrospective analysis. They collected the data pro prospectively, and this is for a single surgeon. And so his technique remains the same throughout the five years that the surgery, uh, the data was collected. The minimum follow-up was 12 months, but the range was anywhere from 12 months to 77 months. So the mean was 42. Um, so the patients included did not have SI joint pain before surgery. So every single patient was um, screened for SI joint pain pre-op. Uh, and then these patients had to complain of new onset back pain after surgery. So post-op, they had new onset SI pain. And none of them got posterior iliac crest uh, bone graft because uh, if you have, um, if you harvest the posterior iliac bone, then you could have possibly have SI joint kind of relate uh, pain that's similar to SI joint pain, but they may be coming from the uh, bone graft harvest site. So uh, they excluded all of them. So their uh, way of um, uh, using graft was uh, they use locally harvested graft and use osteoinductive uh, synthetic grafts. They excluded patients with malignancy, iliac bolts and SI screws, S2 AI screws, sorry, and uh, they, people with persistent back pain that was similar in nature uh, as before surgery. Um, and then they used the annual incidence kind of um, model by the, they had the number of patients who were diagnosed with new SI joint pain that year, and they divide by number of patients who were disease free at the start of the year. It's important because their study went from 12 months to 77 months. So some patients were followed all the way up to 77, and some were just followed for 12 months. So if you're looking at inc annual incidence, you have to have the, the patient who was followed for 77 months, you have to divide the, their incidence by. Um, by 12 months every year, so they use that. Uh, 
The results were, of course, age was in the 50s, mean age was in the 50s, male to female was 45 to 55%. They looked at the number of few segments, so one to uh, four or more segments. And then the other thing they looked at was fusion to sacrum, because of course, if you fuse to sacrum, there is some theory that you'd have more uh, SI joint movement and hence radiographic signs and then hence have some clinical signs of SI joint pain. And then there's a list of diagnoses that they had kind of um, included, which is lumbar disc herniation, degenerative scoli, disc disease, monoesthesis, et cetera, et cetera, but no malignancy. And um, clinical characteristics of these patients, the SI joint pain, again, so age is in the 50s, um, male versus female, 11 versus 27, so more predisposition towards women. And then um, number of S, uh, levels fused, so they had one level, um, well, 15 patients with one level and two patients with 13, and then even lesser patients with three and four levels. Fusion to sacrum was in 22% of the, 22 of the 30 patients versus 16 uh, did not get fusion to sacrum. And the annual incidence, as I mentioned, they kind of had years of follow-up, some patients, they added patients as they went. So annual incidence actually uh, was calculated. And interestingly, um, 4.5, it jumps up at year two. So you have to follow them long enough to know if they would develop pain. And it looks like it stays 4.5, 4.5, 4.6 at two year, three and four year. So their annual incidence after about 24 months kind of stays the same. The frequency of SI joint pain based on fusion uh, of an involvement of sacrum. So if you fuse to sacrum versus not, your incidence was 12.6 uh, if you fuse to sacrum and 11.2 if you didn't. So not a significant difference. Um, and then the, again, the frequency of SI joint pain, if, the, if you fuse more levels, if you fuse one level versus four levels, of course your incidence of SI joint pain increased because you had a bigger lever arm, you had bigger, a lot more forces working at the SI joint. So it went from 11 to 14, but it wasn't, wasn't as big a jump that I would have initially thought it to be. So there are some, some of the limitations here, but I want to kind of look at some of the data presented by uh, in the um, um, references. And um, so SI joint was a cause of pain in 32% of patients with persistent back pain after a lumbosacral surgery. So these patients, not sure if they were uh, previously or uh, pre-op measured or, um, or um, they were used for the, for the, they use a criteria for SI joint pain there, so I'm not quite sure about that, but they still, 32% of patients had back pain after uh, their lumbosacral surgery. 35% of patients have persistent symptoms after spinal fusion that originated from the SI joint. And then onset of, new onset SI joint pain in 28 out of 262 patients who had lumbosacral fusion um, this, this is another study that showed, and the incidence was about 10.7. The difference between this study and our, the study that I'm presenting today was that they used patients with S2AI screws and, and iliac screws. So they, those constructs, of course, transgressed the SI joint there. But again, so the, a lot of previous studies had shown increased incidence up to 20% of SI joint pain when, the, the, when patients had constructs three levels or more. But this study noted that it was about just about 14%, which is not significantly higher than 11% if you had only one level fusion. Um, and this, again, I looked at the radiological data, and of course, patients who have longer fusions, they do get radiologically SI joint degeneration, but the clinical signs of that uh, don't show up in in a lot of patients, as, as seen here, only 11% of patients, 11 to 14% of patients had that. Um, there's no significant difference in patients who had uh, fusion extending to sacrum than who, those who did not. So this is uh, important, and I think this is what uh, was the part, uh, you know, uh, the result of this study. Uh, they excluded all the patients with iliac bolts and S2AI screws. Um, they mentioned about uh, head prominence, but uh, also because you're transgressing the joint, you may be stabilizing it a little bit because the tongue, tongue and groove joint. So uh, having e just even one screw across the joint may stabilize it significantly, uh, especially with um, uh, the forces uh, there. So they routinely assess these sag sagittal parameters. So again, very important that you would have more radiological degradation if your sagittal parameters were off. And so all these patients had good uh, realignment. Um, and the most important part that I got was, you know, the, the big question we're asking today is to fuse or to not fuse. And it's not, 
in even the page 38 patients that developed the SI joint pain, only eight patients needed operative fusion. So of all the patients we had, only eight patients needed surgery. So to, to not fuse and give them a chance makes sense. Um, and the average onset of SI joint pain, again, is 22 months. So some of the patients only had 12 months of follow-up. So this kind of um, makes uh, the limitation of the study is we don't really know if those patients developed uh, SI joint pain in the future. And therefore, the incidence that is presented in this study may be lower than it could have been. Neil, great job. Uh, thank you. Um, can you share the podium to stay there? Um, who's going to go next? Garrett, do you want to try to get your talk up? So um, SI joint pain has become very ubiquitous. Dr. Polly, can you hear us? Dave Polly from Minnesota. Uh, there are few people who have contributed more to the literature than Dave. Uh, let's hear a word from him. Otherwise, my question to you is, so uh, should we routinely do SI joint injections? Oh, there's Dave. Hi, Dave. And there's Scott. Hey, should we routinely do SI joint injections when patients point to their posterior superexpandus process and we're envisioning doing a fusion on them or have some criteria? Scott, what do you think? Should we routinely inject them? Should we kind of be far more aggressive about fusing or trying to identify um, patients who might have SI joint pain when we think about doing a lumbosacral fusion? You're muted, I think. You, you talking? You talking to the arthroplasty guy here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I may be more of an SI pain denier than uh, than a believer. Uh, it, it, I mean, when the problem, if the problem arises, you go ahead and treat it. But this prophylactically extending fusions to SI just uh, it seems like you're just, uh, you know being preemptive and if we're preemptive in all our approaches to to spine we'll be treating a lot of unnecessary levels it's like adding a a degenerative asymptomatic level on a cervical case where they've got a clear radiculopathy from the the pathologic level we're, we're, we're treating treating presumptive stuff and, and x-rays not patients so great way to start a conversation. Dave, what are your thoughts? Should we look at gas signs? Should we kind of have some more emphasis on clinical tests like my favorite hop test, the jump test or something like that? Is there something where we can kind of be more aggressively, intelligently selective about this? Yeah, so so our data suggests that 15% uh, of 15 to 30 percent of patients who present with low back pain actually have SI joint symptoms. And then you get into a series of um, iterative questions that uh, present a challenge. And I think I have a very different patient practice profile than Scott. Uh, I've had very few one level pathology patients present to my clinic. I see much more of a revision practice profile. So, so that's part of my bias. And, and I also have a high SI referral population as well. So they come in with a different cohort. So, so I'll, I'll accept that as a starting point that we're seeing different patients and I'm fine with that. But the first question that I think comes up is when do we need pelvic fixation? And I think that that then starts to drive the equation. And for me, I think the Manzetti review article in clinics and spine surgery uh, in December of 22 is probably the best systematic review and that it shows that there is a 24% prevalence of SI pain postoperatively in patients undergoing spinal fusion. Wide range within the studies ranging from about 1% to about 35%. Um, but I think that that becomes a key piece. The next question is the diagnostic strategy. I think the Fortin finger sign is really important. When they point directly to the PSIS, that's, a, that's important then to follow up on the exam and potentially diagnostic injections if you have a positive physical exam. For me, we use the five physical exam maneuvers rather than the four reported by Mr. Lee. And Mr. Lee is a great surgeon and does good work. But I think in his study, excluding the patients who underwent pelvic fixation is problematic because those are the ones, in my opinion, who are probably at highest risk 
preoperatively because you're doing long fusions and they have adult spinal uh, deformity uh, that then needs that kind of stabilization. And in a prospective randomized controlled trial uh, that we're still analyzing the data on, the preoperative prevalence of SI joint pain in the patients via patient self-report and then confirmatory physical exam was 14%. So a 14% preoperative prevalence in a particular population, I think merits attention. Great, and by the way, thanks for that reference. And Cliff uh, Pierre, our research fellow, was so kind to put that into the chat box. Anybody who wants to see the Manzetti article from Clinical Spine Surgery, it's in there. So thanks, Cliff, and uh, thank you for the pointer. Let's move on. Uh, thank you, Neil. Great job. And Garrett Lewitt is going to talk about uh, a observation in spine trauma, going back, <coughs> excuse me, going back to the origins of lumbar pelvic fixation uh, in a segmental fixation fashion. Uh, a long, long time ago. So um, Garrett Lewitt from Bochum, um, his um, boss is Dr. Schildhauer, who started doing lumbar pelvic fixation before we all really did. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Yeah, as Dr. Chapman already mentioned, this is one of the, the earliest approaches regarding this topic. Um, the paper I would like to present is called Complications Associated with Surgical Stabilization of High-Grade Sacral Fractures Dislocations with Spinal Pelvic Instability by Bella Barber et al. Oh, by Bella Barber et al., um, which was conducted at Harborview Hospital in Seattle, as well as the University of Washington, and published back in 2006. Um, so I would like to start to give you some background information. Um, at this time, there was still the lack of an ideal treatment uh, of patients with fracture dislocations of the sacrum after high energy mechanisms. Um, previous studies have shown satisfactory outcomes with either non-operative or surgical methods, but there was still a lack of a consistent treatment algorithm. Um, the advent of segmental fixation of lumbar spine uh, to the pelvis offered a new um, treatment solution, and therefore um, the authors, authors wanted to evaluate the rate of complications of these procedures. So the object of the study was to review the safety and patient impact of early surgical decompression and rigid segmental stabilization in sacral fracture dislocations. Um, regarding the methodology, um, all patients presenting uh, to Harborview Medical Center between 1997 and 2002 with sacral fractures and disrupted posterior pelvic ring were, post, uh, were prospectively identified and reviewed for specific sacral injury type and neurologic injury. Um, all high-grade sacral fractures, um, so Dennis type 3 <coughs> fractures, and concurrent sacral root injury after high energy mechanisms were included and studies. Um, and as we all know, we see on the right, like a quick repetition of the Dennis classification, as we know, um, type, three, type 3 injuries um, involve the uh, central area of the canal. Um, so the treatment... Um, uh, with a formally established algorithm included a clinical neurological assessment and a radiographic follow-up with CT images. So all patients received a neural element decompression and open reduction um, with segmental internal fixation through midline posterior approach, connecting lumbar um, pedicle screws um, to long iliac screws. Um, regarding the assessment, the authors um, looked at specific adverse events which were infection, wound healing, neurologic deterioration after treatment, post-op loss of sacral fracture reduction, instrumental failure, axial lumbar pelvic pain requiring additional treatment, as well as end-planned secondary surgery. Um, the post-op um, follow-up uh, regarding the alignment, for example, were radiographs after six weeks, three, six, 12, and 24 months. Um, I'll explain the, the different criteria regarding the other advertisements uh, in the following. Um, so just as a quick repetition, what we see here is the, the procedure that the authors performed at Harvey Medical Center. We see the central spinal fixation as well as the uh, pedicle screws on both sides um, towards the, um, yeah, the posterior pelvic ring. All right, let's get to the results. Um, um, as I already mentioned, we're talking about the complications. Here we have an overview um, regarding instrumentation-related as well as wound-related um, effects and um, adverse events, which were the, the main important one in the study. And what we see um, is broken rods appeared in six, um, a number of six of the 19 patients, uh, which means a number, um, a percentage of 31. Um, 
And also mentionable is the overall rate of a second uh, necessity of a second um, operation following wound-related complications um, in 42%. So as a general result, um, as I already mentioned, 19 patients um, with an average age of 32 years were treated by the mentioned algorithm. Um, successful fracture reduction was achieved in all of the patients. 74% um, had a traumatic dural tear or a nerve root avulsion. 31% had a fracture of the connecting, connecting rods. 26% developed a wound healing disturbance. Um, no patient developed the long-lasting complications as well as chronic infections like chronic osteomyelitis, for example. And the average visual analog scale uh, referring to the fracture showed 5.5 of 10 in a one-year follow-up. All right, to conclude, um, what we can say is that a rigid segmental lumbopelvic stabilization allowed for reliable fracture reduction of the lumbopelvic spine and posterior pelvic ring. Procedure, the procedure permits early mobilization without external immobilization. Neurologic improvement in a large number of patients. Um, most complications were related to infection, wound healing, and asymptomatic rod breakage without long-term sequelae. So regarding the discussion, as I already mentioned, this was kind of the first approach regarding uh, this topic. Um, what we can say is that iliosacral screws um, are a percutaneous and a elegant percutaneous method, actually, um, of posterior pelvic ring fixation, but are limited due to requiring virtual anatomic reduction and the absence of anatomic variants. For example, poor bone quality, extensive uh, comminution of the sacrum. Um, Therefore, to provide, therefore, they provide only a little or no load-bearing capacity to a compromised lumbopelvic junction. A lumbopelvic fusion allows a relatively safe exposure and decompression and a reproducible method of open reduction at lumbosacral fragments. But as we know, further research will be required, especially regarding which patients um, are to treat at which um, moment, at which point um, after the injury, and especially which specific surgical method. Thank you very much. Great, Garrett. Thank you. Um, let's get let's get Don up here to catch up a little bit on time. Um, Garrett, can you just stand to the side yeah, a little bit sure. and get uh, um, David um, up? So um, this was an article out of uh, with very little scientific merit, except at the time it was the largest such series and the first such series I think that I'm aware of with segmental lumbopelvic fixation. The main reason why we selected this article was to show that uh, the patients who had broken hardware actually did not have more pain than the people who had intact hardware, right? That's right. That's right. So in Bochum now, you still are one of the leading trauma centers in all of Europe. This is a massive, over a thousand bed trauma center. Mm -hmm. um, do you fuse SI joints when you have lumbopelvic um, fixation? Do you fuse them formally or just instrument? We, we, we do it. We fuse them. You fuse them now. And yeah. why is that? I mean, back at Harborview uh, in the uh, millennial area, uh, era, we did not have much pain. Why would you fuse them now? Yeah, um, I think in the in the meantime, um, a lot of a lot of changed, and um, over the time, um, we really um, yeah had the had the impression and made the experience that uh, really like uh, the stabilization is really still key, and that really um, yeah that prevents from further um, yeah postoperative problems in terms of the patients. That's right, and um, okay. why we did it, I think we will hear in the in the next presentation and the further way yeah. to distinguish. So Dr. Pauli, uh, as a uh, SI joint expert, uh, bar none, so should we nowadays fuse, uh, it's actually news to me that Bochum fuses lumbopelvic injuries formally. Should we formally fuse the SI joint in trauma patients? Um, is there a benefit to have a truly fused SI joint to the ilium, I mean, you and I are uh, trained in air where we just did these large wing osteotomies of the ilium over to the lumbosacral junction, or is stabilization, I call it the metal, metallusion, uh, enough? Great question. Thanks, Jens. So um, what I would suggest is that if you disrupt the sacrotubers and sacrospinous ligaments, the load-bearing pattern of the pelvis is profoundly altered. And so if all we do is restore the articular congruity of the SI joint, we're going to relatively overload it. And so that would be my suggestion that, that if you have enough energy transfer that you've caused a sacral fracture, that you've probably got ligamentous compromise as well. And we're not 
doing what our sports colleagues are doing with reconstructing those ligaments. So the load bearing pattern has to change in order to accommodate it. And so if you're changing the load bearing pattern, in my mind, that speaks to you're going to want the SI joint to be more robust to do that load transfer. Great. Uh, thanks for that answer. All right, let's go on to Don Davis. Thank you, Garrett. Good job. And Don Davis um, is going to talk about open versus minimally invasive sacral leg joint fusion, a multi-center comparison of perioperative measures and clinical outcomes. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures for this general club talk. Uh, <clears throat> background of this case, this was a multi-centered retrospective cohort study. So organizing this study, uh, this was two, organized with 263 patients with SI joint pain and of note, uh, a requirement for this study was to have 12 or 20, 12 and or 24 month postoperative pain scales documented already in their medical chart. Uh, the intervention was uh, using a minimally invasive technique using the uh, SI bone, uh, or I'm sorry, infused triangular titanium TPS coated implants uh, compared to the uh, traditional open posterior technique. Uh, of note, the open posterior approach, there's been a lot described in the literature, but all of the centers that did them in this study uh, were largely similar. They did an open midline approach. Uh, they used autograph, uh, usually BMP. Um, usually they did two 6.5 screws uh, angled from lateral to medial, um, and then they also used various measures of compression um, varying from uh, recon plates to uh, pedicle screws in the ilium and the sacrum with a compression bar. Uh, compared to the MIS approach, which was the uh, intervention study, they used this uh, TPS coated implants, which obviated the need for autograph or other allograph material. Uh, three implants were placed, uh, <clears throat> the first being in the ala cephalad to the first foramen, the second being uh, adjacent or slightly above the first foramen, and the, sec and the third being between the S1 and the S2 foramen, as seen on the radiograph included. Uh, <clears throat> The outcome, the primary outcome was post-operative pain scales with secondary outcomes, looking at length of stay, operative time, estimated blood loss, and complications. And then the time of study, as previously mentioned, was uh, 12 and 24 month uh, follow-up was required for uh, inclusion in this study. Uh, so the minimally and clinically important difference uh, using the VAS, VAS scales was unavailable at the time of publication for SI joint pain, so they used uh, prior literature to, from lumbar uh, lumbar pain to determine the MCID of two, two and then the significant clinical benefits of 2.5 uh, difference in uh, in uh, for the SI for the results here, and uh, you can see um, you can see that uh, the change in the VAS score at 12 months and 24 months was. Uh, much greater in the minimally invasive group uh, with a change of 6.2 compared to 2.7 uh, at 12 months and then 5.6 compared to 2.0 at the 24 month. Um, <clears throat> again, here is the uh, <clears throat> here is the uh, another another graphic demonstrating at uh, two and tw 12 and 24 month. Uh, intervals, the uh, minimally invasive group uh, having 86 and 82 percent. When we looked at secondary results, we saw a significant benefit uh, in terms of operative time being less than half that with the minimally invasive group, as well as the estimated blood loss, which was uh, admittedly not collected in all minimally invasive cases. But in the cases where it was noted in the medical record, uh, the blood loss average was 33 compared to 288. And then the hospital length of stay was just, uh, just over 1.3 days. Uh, for the minimally invasive group, whereas it was over five days for the uh, open group. Uh, similarly, they commented on complications. Uh, the net number of complications was uh, was not significant at 21 and 18. Um, however, the MIS complications mostly were due to falls and facet pain, whereas the open group had a lot of leg pain, neuropathy, and wound issues. Uh, and then 44% of the open group had removal of hardware for iliosacral screw pain. Um, the bottom line, uh, the MIS techniques using the TPS coded implants uh, resulted in more favorable measures, fewer reoperations, and significantly improved clinical outcomes based on this study. Um, there was there was uh, some bias in this study, just to be no, just be mindful of that it was funded by uh, 
by uh, stockholders and um, participants with the SI Joint Bone Company. Uh, limitations were noted also by the authors that um, <clears throat> The limitations also were noted by the offers that there wasn't a prospective study obviously being retrospective and they did note that prior prospective studies had been rejected in the past because uh, the IRBs noted a, a clear in their mind benefit to the minimally invasive techniques and um, denied them from doing the open versus minimally invasive in a blinded way. Great, thank you. Thank you. Scott, tell us about the experience at TBI. So you're uh, one of the leading centers um, uh, in spine care in the country, if not the world, and how has SI joint pain and how has the management focus on SI joint pain affected uh, your all's practice? Is this a common phenomenon? Do you have an SI joint practitioner, just like you have a world-class, um, world-renowned arthroplasty center as an eye joint center with you guys now? You, you bring up a really fascinating issue. So um, our kind of our, our lead investigator on the SI joint was before he retired was was Ralph Rashbaum and we kind of funneled all of our suspected SI pain to him and this is in a, in a big group and he was very selective kind of adhered to the you know on label indications didn't stretch the indications and the numbers were actually pretty small so you know obviously our practice is different from from David's we're not seeing anywhere close to that high a percentage of SI pain in a primary back pain population. Now, having said that, it's become wildly popular because every other company is now copying SI bone. So they've, they've done a, a, a good job of, of creating a market. My, my question is now, segue to 2023, what percentage of primary SI interventions, MIS, are done by surgeons versus interventionalists? None of our interventionalists at TBI have kind of jumped on that bandwagon. What, what's your impression? And, and I'd like to hear David's as well, kind of nationally what, what the numbers are, because I just don't know them. That's a great question. Dave. Yeah, so so Jens, um, I I actually stick to the on-label indications for primary SI fusion. So positive, three positive physical exam maneuvers, confirmatory diagnostic injections, ruling out hip and spine. And in Minnesota, the insurance companies are pretty rigorous about not giving prior auth unless we adhere to that. Uh, so so that's been my practice. And I actually think that that's prudent. The next piece is uh, interventionalists in the community have taken up the allograft bone dial piece, and that's being done primarily at ASCs. And uh, there's been a whole debate with the AMA about coding and stuff like that. And there was a paper at LSRS published by the Hopkins group looking at it, showing a significantly uh, significant rise in the performance of MISSI fusions by the pain practitioners. Uh, Tim Witham was one of the authors on that. Uh, and so I don't know what the current data is, uh, but it has significantly increased and it's a little harder to track because it's ASC outpatient, uh, sometimes cash pay uh, kind of interventions, but that number certainly has increased in the past. <laughs> Hey, David, can I ask you a question? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so, you know, we worry about uh, transition syndromes, and obviously, you know, with the long fusions, we worry about the SI joint. But in those patients that have had primary SI joint fusions, has there been any incidence of the opposite? In other words, having problems at L5S1, uh, I wouldn't suspect of the hip, but you know, you'd question that. But mainly the question is, is there any implication to the spine if you fuse the SI joint? Yeah, so so that's a great question. Uh, and that the data that we have biomechanically suggests that if you fuse L5S1, you increase the motion at the SI joint by 50%. L4 to S1, it's 168%. Conversely, if you fuse the SI joint, 
the stress on L5S1 and L4-5 goes up two to 4%. So two log difference. Um, and the best data that we have biomechanically su suggests fusing the SI joint increases the stress on the hip about 5%, whereas fusing the spine may increase stress on the hip more. And so that's the best biomechanical data that we have. We've been trying to figure that out a little bit and looking at you know, prevalence of total joints and spine fusions in our SI patients and, and vice versa. And what we can say is that in our primary SI fusion patients, that the prevalence of spine fusion to the sacrum exceeds 30%. And so I think it's more spine to SI than it is SI to spine, but a little hard to put um, high quality numbers around that. And, and I guess the reason is because the limited motion of the SI joint compared to the say, lumbosacral uh, level. Uh, yeah, so, yeah so, so I think so. I think so, Rick. I think that's probably the explanation. Um, but I will say there have been people who have had the spine fusion and then, um, uh, then have their SI fused, and they do notice a difference in their ability to get to their feet a little bit. Okay, thanks. Hey guys, let's keep going. We have two more articles, and I think there is a great segue to Brian Anderson, who's standing here at the podium. Uh, his article is looking at uh, S2 AI screws um, and if that has an effect on pain or not. So, Brian, take it away. Good morning. I have no disclosures. So, the title of this article is Sacral Public Fixation with S2 AI Screws May Prevent Sacroiliac Joint Pain After Multi Segment Spinal Fusion. It's so a retrospective case control study, level three evidence, and it was done out of Akita Kusi Medical Center in Akita, Japan. It was published in Spine in September of 2019. Causes of low back pain after multi-segment lumbar and lumbosacral fusion are various from iliac, cra iliac graft, graft harvesting sites, ASD, pseudoarthrosis, implant-related pain, SI joint arthrosis. Proximal and junctional kyphosis, proximal junctional kyphosis is also common after multi-segment lumbo and lumbosacral fusion. These researchers uh, endeavored to answer three questions. Do S2AI, does S2AI public fixation and multi-segment fusion, which anything more than three levels, does it reduce post-operative SI joint pain? Does it reduce PJK? And does it does improve post-operative lumbopelvic climate parameters. So the methods for this study, there was three spine surgeons at a single center. Uh, they operated on 77 patients. In inclusion criteria included adult spinal deformity and any uh, surgery that was multi-segment greater, greater than or equal to three levels. Exclusion criteria were patients with preoperative SI joint pain. And they operated on these patients between 2011 and 2012. They split their patients into three groups. There was an L5 group where they ended their construct at L5. There was a sacrum group where they ended at S1. And there was a pelvis group where they ended at S2AI. You can see that there's some uh, homogeneity uh, among the groups as far as how many participants. Um, the average time of follow-up was minimum two years, but extended to about two and a half years on average across all groups. The number of segments fused ranged from six to seven, and that corresponds with like a T10 to sacrum or T10 to pelvis <coughs> type surgery. Most common diagnosis was lumbokyphoscoliosis. Uh, diagnosis of SI joint pain after surgery was done with um, uh, using this uh, scoring system and any score that was greater than or equal to four, uh, in addition to SI joint uh, lidocaine injection with 70% relief. Uh, diagnosis of PJK after surgery is pretty standard. They used 10 degrees as their measurement and they did UIV, UIV plus two. And then the methods for assessing lumbar public sagittal alignment was pretty standard, as was their statistics. So in results, all 77 patients had amelioration of the preoperative symptoms. Uh, however, 12 patients did develop SI joint pain. In the uh, L5 group, it was 16.7%. In the sacrum group, it was 26%. And in the pelvis, or the S2AI group, it was 4%, which translated into just one patient. Um, 21 patients developed uh, PJK. The only statistical uh, significant uh, uh, statistic here is with the uh, S2AI group. Here you can see a table uh, uh, chart demonstrating this with SI joint um, pain and uh, in dark gray and then PJK in light gray.
So the patient demographics of the SI joint pain and proximal junctional kyphosis, you can see that the male to female ratio is uh, a preponderance of female. Um, in the initial part of the study, about 20 to 50 percent of the patients were male in any given group, but here it's only about 10 or less than 10 percent. And then you can see the number of fused segments was uh, somewhere around four to five, and we initially said that most, uh, most of the patients in each group were somewhere around six to seven on average. In the one patient that did have right SI joint pain after S2 AI instrumentation, they did get a CT and they found that that screw was improperly placed. It did not even cross the SI joint. And the authors thought that this may be the reason why the patient developed uh, that SI joint pain. With regards to the public parameters that they evaluated, uh, they found no significant difference uh, between the three groups, or if you looked at the patients that actually had SI joint pain or PJK after the surgery and compared those to the patients that did not have those two diagnoses, there was no statistical difference with the lumbopelvic parameters. So in summary, this study demonstrated that SI joint fusion significantly decreased SI joint pain compared to ending at L5 or the sacrum. Uh, PJK was unaffected by the LIV, and the pelvic parameters were not significantly different across these three groups. The study definitely had some limitations. It was retrospective in design, it was small sample sizes, the length of follow-up was moderate at a minimum two years. Uh, there was certainly some uh, room for selection bias in this study. There's a lack of reporting on risk factors for PJK and SI joint pain, such as bone density, BMI, diabetes, smoking status. All patients received posterior spinal instrumented surgery, that's quoted from the paper, without mention of deformity correction, construct design, or inner body techniques. So there might be some possible heterogeneity of surgical treatments used. 70% relief after SI joint injection is a little high. Um, this could lead to some possible underreporting of that diagnosis, and then no report of subsequent treatment for patients who developed the SI joint pain. We don't know if their pain was adequately treated with Tylenol or if they actually went on to an actual fusion uh, thereafter due to their pain. So uh, I think that data interpretation is difficult given the study limitations. The cranial caudal, caudal segment failure is uh, absolutely a significant risk in adult spinal deformity surgery. S1, as we know, is a poor stopping point for large constructs, and the study certainly leaves room for improvement um, with larger and better quality studies needed. Thanks. Great job, Brian. I think there's a, a, a head of Dr. Pauly in that image there. Actually, that's cool. Dave, I don't want to use the standard of care verbiage, but uh, is it highly recommendable now to have some form of iliac fixation or pelvic fixation for longer fusions? And that term needs to be defined, obviously. Great question. Best we can tell, L3 and above, um, high degree of consensus of using adjunctive pelvic fixation, variability about iliac versus S2AI. Longer than that, I think that's probably also the case. High demand, like high-grade spondylolisthesis, probably also. Then the area of controversy is the shorter segment fusions, L4 to S1. When should you do that? Again, I think the best data there is probably high BMI and high PI are the ones that I would define as at risk. And a, a higher degree of osteoporosis if you then have to do a fixation. Yes, I completely agree with that. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing up the osteoporosis piece. And, and you put those three together and you can either fix it initially or you can have their sacral fracture and fix it subsequently. Been there. Uh, let me ask my partner, Dr. Ami Abdul-Jabbar. So I'm obviously more an iliac crest guy and he's a uh, young generation um, uh, enterprising. Uh, iliac fixation versus S2AI, where do you stand? You've been trained in both techniques since you're a NAV guy. What should we do? Um, <clears throat> I like to use both. Um, I, I do tend to go towards the S2AI trajectory um, in general uh, for a kind of standard primary deformity. Um, if we do need extra fixation uh, in terms of a quad rod technique, I do like using both an iliac, traditional iliac and an S2AI. Um, you know, for <clears throat> really bad sacral fractures, we've had some of those um, really want to use the traditional iliac technique. Uh, so I think it depends, um, but I do I do like the S two AI technique. I think that it uh, helps with keeping the screws in alignment and the overall 
um, kind of continuity of the of the rods and and you know getting that correction. So um, I I do more S two AI, but I, I do still use plenty of iliac bolts as well. And let me ask my uh, TBI colleagues. So Rick Scott, I know you're not big deformity guys, and we don't have Izzy on or uh, Jack. Uh, what do you see being done more? Is there a preference for one one versus the other technique? You got you got Rick and I both here. Oh, cool. You got so us both, what, what, but none of our none of our Scully guys are on to uh, to answer yeah, that no. question. So you we got your, we got nothing for you. No, but what in your conferences do you see being done more? Just a unbiased opinion. What do you see I being done more? Definitely see more uh, pelvic fixation, multiple rods. I mean, no, no one's going the direction of less of less hardware these days. Yeah, the, the bedrock procedures become very, very popular. Izzy is a, a big proponent of that. We know. So let's look at biomechanics. Uh, what are you holding in your hand there, Scott? Is that a model oh, for an SI joint arthroplasty? <laughs> yeah. Is that your SI joint arthroplasty model? Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Old. It's, it's, it's a little uh, um, little leaf from a country we're not supposed to do business with. <laughs> <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Gautam Rao. Uh, the, the, he's a chief resident at USF Infolded Fellowship with us. Uh, his family, fortunately, and his colleagues in Tampa were okay after um, Zilda's uh, torrent. Um, so glad to have you here. Glad everybody's well. He's going to talk about biomechanics of lumbar pelvic fixation. Uh, so share your thoughts with us. Thanks for being here, Gautam. Thank you. Um, so correct. My my presentation is on. Uh, biomechanics study uh, done with by the Barrow Group, uh, biomechanics of laterally placed SI joint fixation supplemental to S2AI fixation and a uh, long segment cadaveric study uh, looking at the different uh, stresses and strains on screws um, and rods and other uh, mechanical aspects of it just to kind of tie everything into why we do um, add, well, we, why we may add SI joint fusion in addition to the S2 AI for long constructs. Um, introduction, uh, the rates of pseudoarthrosis is around 24% for uh, constructs ending at S1, um, so uh, pretty high. It's a, not a great load-bearing structure. Uh, that's why people used to do more iliac screws to fixate. Um, the S2 AI screw has gained in popularity over the past few years uh, with similar biomechanical principles to uh, iliac screw, um, typically a plastic right. section, uh, and need for offset connectors, uh, given the uh, starting point, and you're able to put it into line with the rod uh, for the rest of the construct pretty easily. Uh, and, really crazy, but uh, the SI showing fusion. studies at three levels that show pain. So it's just crazy a little bit. She literally does have bipolar, but um, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm the black. Can you, can you mute yourself? Where was that? Yeah. Um, SI joint so, fusion uh, stabilizes the SI joint times, so um, back on and typically we'll need what? more than one implant to aid in stability uh, so that it doesn't rotate around that one axis. There's essentially multiple points of fixation given its complex um, movement patterns. So the main question of this research uh, paper was to look at, does eminently invasive SI joint fixation um, stabilize the SI joint more than a traditional S2 AI screw. So um, this was a cadaveric study uh, done with eight cadavers. The instrumentation was uh, L2 to S1 with a L5 a S1 A lift uh, with a supplemental S2 AI screw and then a uh, bilateral SI joint fusion using two uh, titanium spacers. So the way that they uh, did the model was they had um, all of these wires and, and points of uh, strain and stress uh, added to their cadaver. They did the intact version first and then added the screws and rods and the primary construct and then added S2 AI screws and then added um, the SI joint fixation uh, and tested them kind of uh, at that. Uh, point. So it was kind of a, a throughout the, the course of the cadaver's uh, history. So 
what do we find or what did they find? They found that uh, overall, uh, there's a mean global rotation rate of uh, 7.5 uh, newton meters. Um, about three, or so this is how they tested it. Three cycles of non constraining pure movement was applied in uh, all directions so flexion, extension, lateral bending, uh, and axial rotation, and then followed by uh, gravitational compression forces to mimic uh, the strain and stress of uh, normal physiology conditions. So they found that uh, instrumented uh, S2 to L2 to S1 range of motion decreased in all directions compared to the intact model. With S2 AI fixation, there was decreased L5 S1 range of motion compared to the uh, only S1 fixation. And the addition of S2 AI screws, um, reduced, screw L reduced S1 screw bending during flexion um, but interestingly, adding the lateral S2, uh, adding the lateral SI joint fusions did not change the, or significantly did not change any of the movement constraints uh, in addition to the S2 AI. So this is one of the um, graphs, they're all very similar in terms of their um, modest amount of uh, improvement, you know, large error bars, um, minimal improvement, really right lateral bending was the only one that really worked uh, on one of the uh, constraints. Everything else was similar and not as statistically significant. Um, so what does that mean? The, the discussion there, this is obviously a biomechanical study looking at L2 to S1 with uh, added uh, points of fixation. Uh, there are have been other studies that looks at uh, different types of biomechanical studies as well as were discussed, but it seems that addition adding an S2 AI screw to a long segment construct stabilizes the S1 joint, and uh, the need for additional SI joint fusion is not as necessary given uh, the uh, unilateral fixation. Uh, the concern was that if it's just one long axis, that there's still extra rotation and, and strain on the stress, uh, strain on the joint and the screws and the rods, but that seemed to not be the case. Um, in so much that adding the S2 AI uh, greatly decreased the motion of the SI joint, and again, adding the extra fixation didn't really change much. Uh, fusion of the sacrum did not significantly uh, alter SI joint movement compared to the intact condition. Um, the SI joint doesn't move that much to begin with, but um, clinically, even a small amount of, a small degree of motion can lead to uh, a lot of pain. So hard to say, again, because it's a biomechanical study using a cadaver, if this would translate to uh, more um, physiologic conditions. Um, and again, supplementing the S2AI with the titanium SI joint <coughs> implants did not significantly reduce the motion. Um, compared to just the S2AI screw. So this is an important thing. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, Dave, I'll, I'll uh, hit you first. So we're on the closing moments here, but uh, how much pelvic fixation do we really need? When do we need uh, stacked iliac screws? When, when do we need supplemental SI joint fixation? You have pioneered some great new technologies, but some of those x-rays look intimidating. There's so much metal in there relative to bone. So when, where, what do we do? Should we do now as you do longer fixations? Great question. Uh, best data that I'm aware of, ISSD K-series, 23% rate of pelvic fixation failure. Uh, so the question becomes, what is an acceptable rate of pelvic fixation failure to you and your constructs? Uh, high demand spinal deformity makes sense to me. It appears that four rods to the pelvis, as opposed to four rods to the sacrum and pelvis, uh, is protective. And so if I've got a high demand, say T10 to pelvis or more, more cephalad, then I'm definitely going with a, a quad rod uh, construct. Jens, what about you? We've got these new constructs with the uh, kind of fusion of the SI joint while you're doing, you do a lot of deformity. Are you uh, jumping on that trend or uh, do you feel that it's necessary? And so, uh, again, I don't know the answer. I have 
subjectively done far more SI joint fusions and quote at risk patients. I am still not totally sure who needs SI joint actually fused and who doesn't. I agree with uh, Dave that there's a radiographic at least loosening rate um, that's still around somewhere 20 to 30 percent going back to our old Harborview trauma data. So. Um, it makes me uh, sad. I, I agree with Dave that having four rods that cross the lumbosacral junction may be better. Uh, I'm still reluctant to put large, um, very large uh, metal pieces across it because, again, our uh, Maryland friends showed us some very uh, troubling uh, images where they've had just horrendous failures when these things loosen or get infected. So. I'm still a biggest, I'm still ready to learn. Congratulations on your deformity course last week. It was great. And uh, this was again, one of the subjects that was very heavily debated. Dave, I hope we'll have you here next week uh, for SRS and uh, can lure you into uh, our STED talk area or something like that. We have a couple of SRS members who are going to do a little mini symposium here as a more, but uh, any final words of wisdom? So you, you have clearly opened up our eyes. Um, by the way, some of your quotes, we just put them into the uh, chat box for all those who are interested to get those references you mentioned. Thank you for sending those also. Uh, so what should we do? What's our take home message? Fuse the SI joint or not? Is the SI, we know that the SI joint hurts. Uh, should we be more proactive with diagnostics? Give us a final word of wisdom from your end. Do an exam. Examine the patient, touch the patient and see what they have going on. If you're doing a high demand construct, I like to say if you're building a bridge and two by twos will handle 80% of the load and four by fours will handle 98% of the load, what bridge do you want to cross? All right, wise words. So Scott, close us out. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to uh, David's words of wisdom on, on SI. He echoes what uh, my retired partner, Ralph Rashbaum, used to discuss, which is a very meticulous clinical exam. Um, all good stuff. And uh, everybody enjoy the long holiday weekend. All right, thank you all. Nice. Good job. Yes. Take care. Have a good weekend. Same to you. Thank you. Sorry, I had technical difficulty, Jens. I was fighting with my computer the whole time. <laughs> Who won? Uh, well, I think I finally won. I finally figured yeah, it out. I'm finished. Yeah. <laughs> Body blow. Good to see All you. Right. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye bye. We look forward to that. Take okay. care, guys. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Are we off? Are we off?